I released a video on the effect fasting has on cancer and the video absolutely took off. People seemed extremely interested in the topic. I received a mass influx of comments, most of which being really supportive. Thank you. And many strongly encouraging me to discuss what I'll be discussing here. Cancer as a metabolic disease. Most of the hubbub, hubbub, that's a funny word, yet entirely accurate. Uh, much of the hubbub around cancer being a metabolic disease stems from a researcher named Dr. Thomas Seafried. Well, I decided to read his studies to ultimately make sense of this seeming paradigm shift in understanding cancer. So I'll describe some of the evidence in favor of a cancer being a metabolic disease, some of the molecular mechanisms, and then I'm going to offer a few words, probably more than a few words, on the topic, because I think that you deserve a bit more context than what a vocal minority are now espousing as gospel. But hey, before we get into things, I would like to point out two things. Uh, one in my favor and one against me. First, yes, I am qualified to discuss this topic. Uh, on my discussions of more controversial topics, I often get comments telling me that I'm an ignorant fool and worse. <laughs> that may be the case in many aspects of life, but not here. If you're new to Physionic, at the time of this recording, I'm finishing my PhD in molecular medicine. I worked in a metabolism laboratory during my master's, and I currently do lab research using cancer cells and my background is in metabolism. Okay, the self-aggrandizing out of the way, I would like to point out something else as well. While I know more than the average person about cancer, I also acknowledge that I have much to learn and will be doing so as I dive deeper into the research on the topic. Okay, disclaimers out of the way, I still fully expect comments telling me that I'm an idiot and asking for my credentials, but let's carry on. Dr. Seafried seems to be spearheading this idea that cancer is predominantly a metabolic disease, but how is he coming to these conclusions? Well, as I mentioned at the top, I read several scientific reviews on the topic, one of which was written by Dr. Seafried. Therein, he mentions multiple lines of evidence in rebuttal of what is known as the somatic theory of cancer, which describes genetic mutations as the primary driver of cancer. What are these objections then Dr. Seafried presents? One, some cancers do not have gene mutations. That's a pretty stunning one because it slaps the somatic theory straight across the face. If the somatic theory describes cancer as being mutationally driven, then having cancers without genetic mutations is pretty damning. Two, what are known as oncogenic driver genes are present in cancer cells as well as in healthy cells. That means that genes that are implicated in cancer progression are ubiquitous and not just found in cancer cells. Three, chimpanzees who share 98% of their genome with ours have an absence of cancer, yet humans develop cancer. Another intriguing point. Fourth, Implanting the nucleus, which is the section of the cell that houses most of our genes, from a cancer cell into a healthy cell does not make the healthy cell cancerous. But if you implant the mitochondria of the cancerous cell into the healthy cell, it becomes cancerous. Those are the four main points, and this has ultimately led to what has been dubbed the mitochondrial metabolic theory, which is the opposite of the previously mentioned somatic mutation theory. Essentially, the mitochondrial theory says that cancer arises from a disruption of mitochondria to generate ATP, which is cellular energy, which ultimately leads cancer cells to undergo a shift to glucose or carbohydrate metabolism for their generation of ATP, cellular energy. This is akin to the much discussed Warburg effect that cancers rely heavily on glucose metabolism to generate energy. Technically, there's much more to the Warburg effect, but we won't get into that right now. The point is, our cells are capable of generating cellular energy through mitochondria-dependent mechanisms and mitochondria-independent mechanisms. If the cells are forced to use mitochondria-independent mechanisms, known as anaerobic glycolysis, due to the dysfunction of mitochondria, then cancer arises. 
That's likely where this idea stems that low carbohydrate diets are superior for eliminating cancer. And similarly, this is the idea that people on my fasting video really pounced on. So cancer can't survive if you don't consume food. Okay, let's look at these points from a scientific standpoint. One, some cancers do not have gene mutations. That's true according to another scientific review, wherein the researchers also point out that some cancers have zero detectable gene mutations. Additionally, they point out that some childhood cancers are devoid of mutations found in the same cancer in adults. However, there are some explanations for this phenomenon. One, some genes are only expressed during childhood and are then closed, literally being locked up in a structure called heterochromatin. Then adult genes are opened to take over the role of the childhood gene, which is one of the strategies that scientists use to treat sickle cell anemia. Two, there are other studies that indicate cancer progression independent of gene mutation, as well as caused by different factors, so not necessarily mitochondrial. This study points out that if the area around the cells, the place that they actually anchor to, can undergo changes that influence the cell to become cancerous, independent of genetic mutations. However, the researchers point out that gene mutations do not necessarily need to be present for cancer to occur, because it is entirely possible that these cells undergo epigenetic changes that influence the cell to become cancerous. What are epigenetics, you might ask? That just happens to feed us nicely into our second point. There are known oncogenic drivers in healthy cells as well as cancer cells, which is really a head scratcher if you consider that gene expression or the reading of genes by the cell to generate functional proteins to be a relatively static process. However, it isn't. Much of the reason why is due to epigenetics. If you're unfamiliar, epigenetics are simply molecular tags that are attached to DNA and surrounding structures that make up our genes. These tags can either inhibit the cell from expressing or reading the gene, or they can enhance or encourage the cell to express that gene. So a pro-cancerous gene could be repressed by epigenetics in healthy cells, and the same gene can be expressed by other epigenetic tags in cancerous cells, leading to a different outcome, all the while keeping the actual gene structure, the DNA molecules, intact, unmutated. One more question that you might have is, why do our cells even have these pro-cancerous genes then? That's a really good question, and the answer is actually really simple. Many of your cells need to divide, replicate, and that is facilitated by a host of genes that we can broadly call as our go genes. In the subset of go genes, we have pro-cancerous genes or oncogenic drivers. These genes aren't in our genome to specifically cause cancer. They serve a primary purpose like initiating cell division, and unfortunately, they can sometimes become the main drivers of cancer because they are overexpressed or overread due to constitutive mutations or epigenetic tags or other influencers on the process. I'll lean on this scientific review as my citation for that point. Okay, let's move on to number three. And don't worry, I realize this is a lot of information, so I'll sum it up all for you and really hammer home the context near the end. Number three, chimpanzees rarely get cancer, yet humans do far more frequently. I actually had no idea about this. This is the first time I've ever heard it, but then again, I'm no Jane Goodall, and I only focus on humans. Anyway, if chimpanzees share 98% of the genome with us, why is there such a great disparity? As a matter of fact, let me quantify that for you. In some extreme cases, humans experience 10 times more cancer than great apes. Well, this has been directly investigated and there are multiple answers. One, according to these researchers, some of the heavily cancer-associated genes are unfortunately found in the remaining 2% of DNA difference. However, beyond that, chimpanzee genes may share the same genetic sequence for a gene, 
but may also have additional DNA molecules extending the gene, thereby creating a slightly different protein, although the majority of the protein is identical. Additionally, in 15% of cancer genes, there are frame shifts, meaning that although the gene is the same, the points at which the gene is read can be different, leading to incomplete or partial reading of the gene by the cell. The point is, yes, there is significant homology or similarity between us and chimpanzees, but looking at the genome alone and calling it a day is an insufficient investigation. There are other examples, but let's move on to the second reason before I belabor the point. Okay, two, the most obvious one. We have vastly different life expectancies, and much of that is influenced by modern medicine being capable of curing or treating many diseases, and as we age, our likelihood of cancer increases. Three, the researchers of this same analysis do acknowledge that there may be lifestyle factors like nutrition that impact our rates of cancer. So there's a light in favor of this mitochondrial metabolic theory. However, there are also other factors that fit under that umbrella of lifestyle, like the amount of consumption, sedentary life, exposure to carcinogens, and much more. So yes, nutrition is one aspect, but it's one section of one part of three parts. Finally, let's address the fourth overall point, the nuclear and mitochondrial transplantation studies. I find these experiments incredibly interesting and wildly cool. So these experiments are called cybrid experiments, and the researchers do two things. One, they take the nucleus from the cancerous cells, you know, where the genetic mutations would occur because 99% of our genes are housed in the nucleus, and implant the nucleus into healthy cells. If the somatic mutation theory were right, it would lead these cells to become cancerous because the same mutations are now present. Secondly, the researchers take mitochondria out of cancerous cells and implant them into healthy cells and see if that causes cells to become cancerous. Fascinatingly, if we return to Dr. Seafried's review and another primary study, only when the cells are exposed to cancerous mitochondria do they begin displaying cancerous behavior, not when they are exposed to the cancerous derived nucleus. That seems like an open and shut case in favor of the mitochondrial theory. Well, it's certainly compelling evidence, and in my estimation, it's the strongest evidence. However, this doesn't inform on the epigenetic changes that occur within the nucleus. So the mechanisms still need to be teased out. Still, they're fascinating experiments. So does that settle it? Is cancer a metabolic disease? Well, before we come to some conclusions, I'd like to point out that we've highlighted some evidence in favor of the mitochondrial metabolic theory, and we've discussed some of the explanations, but there is also direct evidence against this theory. So allow me to show you just a little of that, and then we'll circle back around and put a nice little bow on this video. I'll just discuss two pieces of evidence against the mitochondrial metabolic theory, although there are multiple lines of evidence. One, although cancers do not have complete penetrance, meaning that no one gene is uniformly dysregulated, be it through mutation, epigenetic, or otherwise, there are several cancers that are dependent on key genes to be mutated or otherwise dysfunctional, like the gene that generates the cancer suppressor P53, which is mutated in up to 50% of cancers. In many cases, but not all, if P53 is functional, cancer will not occur. However, if it is made dysfunctional, cells will suddenly become cancerous. This type of evidence is independent of any other factor and implicates genes directly. The second point is a powerful one, just about as powerful as the cybrid experiments. In the mitochondrial metabolic theory, it's thought that the mitochondrial dysfunction leading to cancer progression is caused by defective cell energy production machinery within the mitochondria. Your mitochondria contain an array of proteins called the oxidative phosphorylation proteins, or OxFos for short. These proteins are critical for the generation of cellular energy through mitochondria, remember the ATP. 
However, according to this theory, these proteins are dysfunctional and therefore, as the cell must rely less and less on mitochondria for its energy generation, it turns to the anaerobic or mitochondria independent metabolism pathway that we briefly went over way back at the beginning of this video. It feels like ages ago now. I think I've grown some white hair since then. Anyway, this mitochondria independent pathway is called anaerobic glycolysis, and it relies on glucose or carbohydrates for the generation of cellular energy. So naturally, one might think, and I alluded to many people thinking this way, that if we starve the cancerous cells of glucose by eliminating carbohydrates from our diet or simply not eating altogether, we can then eliminate cancer. However, I have some bad news on that front. According to both of these reviews, there are multiple cancers that can use fat for metabolism, meaning that they have functional mitochondria, because fat can only be metabolized for energy in mitochondria. Not only that, some cancers thrive on fat over carbohydrates. These types of cancers will actually overexpress fat-related genes to encourage more fat to enter the cell and thereby allow for greater energy generation, not to mention the host of additional cellular benefits that we simply don't have the time to get into. According to this review, the suppression of cancer's ability to oxidize or utilize fat for energy dramatically reduces their ability to grow and makes them more susceptible to dying. Cancers like certain leukemias, ovarian cancers, prostate cancers, and other cancers are all prone to this effect. So clearly, there are some shortcomings of looking at cancer through this mitochondria-centric perspective. And that's coming from a person who has actually published on mitochondria. Okay, this video is getting exceedingly long, so let's put this all together now that you've been sufficiently confused. I'll make this as clear as possible. Is cancer a metabolic disease? Based on what I've read so far, and I need to continue to read and analyze more studies, the answer is yes. Cancer can be affected by metabolism, sometimes heavily so. However, is it as simple as cutting out carbohydrates or fasting? No. The type of cancer is of the utmost importance, as well as the progression of that cancer. Some cancers may be more susceptible to a lower carbohydrate nutrition, and other cancers may be more susceptible to a healthy, high carbohydrate nutrition. But no doubt there is a metabolic component. Additionally, does this exclude the somatic theory from being correct? Well, it certainly raises some questions that need to be addressed, which might lead the theory to be tweaked or to include more of a metabolic point of view. There is good evidence on both sides, and why wouldn't they coexist? Some cancers being more metabolically motivated and others being more genetically motivated. Cancer is probably the most insane, most frustrating disease known to man. So while we'd love a simple answer, and maybe for some cancers there really is a simple answer, the reality of cancer as a whole is that it is entirely too heterogeneous, too complex to think that one solution will be the universal saving grace to this treacherous disease. As with all complex topics, the devil is in the details. Look, I've covered less than 1% of the information out there on the topic, and over time I do expect to cover many more of the nuances as I release more videos, but for now I'll be diving into this exact topic in far more depth in my detailed study analysis that you can find right here when it releases. And otherwise, you might be interested in some of my other related videos. Thanks for your patience, and I'll hope to speak with you soon. Bye.